Good morning, once again. Buenos dias. Bom dia. Any uh, Portuguese? Brazilians? No? Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Any Dutch? No? Uh, well, thank you for having me. Uh, Pastor Sam must have been thinking that I have a lot, of, lot to say this morning. There are two notes in my bulletin. Anybody else get two? No? Okay. There must be a lot of good stuff to say. So, Well, let's turn together uh, in the book of Job, chapter number one. I've been preaching through Job back home, and so uh, it's a book that we may not be familiar with. It's a very long book from the Old Testament. Uh, you, might, you might know something of it, maybe not all the details, because it is very lengthy, but uh, let's look this morning together at uh, chapter one, and then we're going to read down through chapter two at verse number 10. Uh, this is the opening uh, scene of the book. This sets the scene, sets the stage, so to speak, uh, for what goes on uh, in the rest of the book. So hopefully after you hear uh, what the, what, what the story is about and how it uh, begins, it'll encourage you, uh, inspire you to go on and read the whole book and... Uh, you can send me emails, I guess, and ask me questions. <laughs> you can listen online, too, to, to figure out uh, what, uh, what the story says uh, as it continues. So uh, chapter 1, at verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz. Oh, and I'm reading the ESV, so I think you guys use, you guys use ESV? Okay, good. Okay, ESV. Uh, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil, there were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast at the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters and eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered him, the, the, the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased the lands. But stretch out your hand, touch all that he has, he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a rain on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead." and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Again, 
There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still, he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So far, God's wonderful words, may he write them upon our hearts today. Well, uh, many, many centuries ago, uh, every single weekday, Monday through Friday, for six consecutive months, 159 sermons, uh, the great reformer of the city of Geneva, John Calvin, preached through the book of Job. 159 sermons. How long's your longest series? <laughs> a little bit later on, there was, a, there was an English reformed, a Puritan pastor named Joseph Carroll. And every three weeks, it wasn't every, every day or every week, but every three weeks, he would give a lecture, a special lecture in his church, think of it like a midweek Bible study, uh, to his congregation. He did that for 424 sermons. It took him 24 years to preach through Job. It's a little extreme, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, there's a story that said that uh, his son traveled from England all the way around Africa to India. He made his way back from India all the way back around Africa to London, and his dad had barely gotten through the next chapter of Job. So you've heard of the patience of Job, right? I'm not going to test yours today. Martin Luther, another reformer, said this of Job. He said, the language of this book is more vigorous and splendid than any other book in all the scriptures. It's a wonderful book. It's it's acknowledged across the world by scholars and literature, uh, scholars and philosophers and uh, those who study religion and Christians as being a beautiful book, a wonderful story, uh, an example of true uh, inspirational literature. But we know it's the word of God. It's the word of God to us. Uh, What do you think the message of Job is? When you saw this morning, maybe on the bulletin there, Job, what do you think Job's about? And no doubt you probably think, like most of us probably think, Job is about why do I suffer? Why do I suffer? But if you turn to Job expecting an answer to that question, the why question, you're gonna be sorely disappointed. You might go away sad. You might read the whole story. You might think, well, he's beginning today. I'm gonna keep reading it. You're gonna be disappointed if you want a particular answer to your particular suffering. God doesn't give it to us. Instead, the book of Job is about this. It's when I suffer. It's It's not if I suffer, and it's not why I suffer, but when I suffer, whose wisdom do I trust? Do I trust myself? And in Job's case, he has his wife. And if you keep reading, he's got four friends with great names to name your children after or your grandkids after. These are great names. Elihu, Zophar, Bildad, Eliphaz, great names. Do I trust myself, my friends, my wife? Do I trust the wisdom of man or do I trust God in all this? That's what the book's about. It's when I suffer. Not if and not why, but when. Whose wisdom do I trust? And if you skip to the end of the book, you you see that God never answers that big why question. 
Instead, uh, the New Testament book of James, chapter five, uh, tells us that when he suffered, he patiently submitted himself to his heavenly father, patiently submitted himself in perseverance. He never got an answer, but he still trusted God's all-wise plan for his life, and we see that today. Notice, first of all there, there's a first point there in the, order, in the, uh, the sermon notes page. Uh, the story begins here with a description about this man, a description about this man. You see that in the first uh, few verses there. He lives in the land of Uz. Uh, we know from the Old Testament this is most likely somewhere east of the promised land, uh, somewhere uh, out there in the desert, in the wilderness. He's, Job is one of those Old Testament saints, one of those Old Testament believers that's actually not associated with the, the promised people. He's not a Jew. He's a Gentile, most likely. It's kind of interesting. Uh, more importantly, the narrative tells us that uh, this man was blameless. That means he was a man of integrity. This man was upright. He lived a righteous life. Uh, he feared God. And we know from the Bible that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He feared God, even though he was a Gentile outside of the promised land. Uh, and he turned away from evil. He wasn't sinless. Don't get that impression. He wasn't sinless at all. Uh, he goes on to sin many times. Uh, if you read the story, he even confesses his own sins. He's not a sinless man, but he's a godly man. Uh, he's not sinless, but he's sincere, if you can put it that way. He's sincere. He trusts God through thick and thin, through blessings and curses, good times uh, and bad. And while he was very fruitful, we see there in the story, uh, he's multiplying, he's filling the earth. He used that Genesis language. Uh, he has seven sons. He has three daughters. And he's somewhat of a business mogul, isn't he? he he's somewhat of a, of a very shrewd businessman, a very prosperous businessman. Uh, in those ancient days, and Job is probably somewhere around the time of Abraham, maybe a little after, a little before, we're not quite sure, but somewhere about 2,000 years before Jesus Christ was born. He's an ancient man. It's an ancient story. And the way that you would calculate your wealth back in those days was not how big your 401k was uh, or your IRA or whatever your retirement plan might be, but you calculated it up with how many animals you had. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, uh, 500 ox, uh, oxen, 500 female donkeys, ma very many servants. He was a very prosperous, uh, blessed businessman and a godly man at that. Uh, the conclusion was this in verse three, that he was the greatest of all the people of the East. And I think it's uh, just a quick little point of application. As you think about Job and all the wealth and the blessings that he had, that the Bible doesn't condemn wealth itself. It's not the point of the text, but just as a little aside, uh, the question is not, uh, does God condemn money? No, it's, it's how we use our money. It's how we use our wealth. He's a godly man. He's a wealthy man. He's a wealthy man. He's a godly man. He's, he has the best of both worlds. Uh, this is why Paul can say to us later on in the New Testament that uh, he says, as for the rich in this world, this is uh, 1, Tim 1 Timothy 6, as for the rich in this world, he doesn't condemn riches. He assumes that there are some who have lots of wealth, but it's what they do with it. They are to do good, he says, to be rich in good works, generous, ready to share. Job was that kind of a man. We see his piety, his, his godliness, his fear, his love for God, his uh, his, his godliness, his sanctification, all these words we use to describe uh, a good man. We see his piety in action. Uh, he wasn't the kind of a dad who told his kids, do as I say, not as I do. No, notice that. His, 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 his sons, they have sort of this family calendar. Uh, and every time the, the calendar falls upon the next son, they have into that son's house this large family festival. Uh, and so the, the text tells us that there was a family festival, verse four. Uh, there was a lot of frolicking there, a lot of fun, a lot of festivity. Uh, and Job, though, acts as a family priest. There wasn't yet a temple that was priests and sacrifices. And so Job was the family priest. He would rise up early in the morning, notice, and offer burnt offerings for each of his children. Why would he do that? Why would he take his wealth, his animals, and sacrifice them? Because just in case, he says, one of my children may have sinned in their heart and cursed God. What a model of a man this is. 
this is a prosperous man, this is a hardworking man, this is a blessed man, this is a wise man, this is a godly man. He's a man to follow. He's the kind of man the psalmist describes in Psalm 1, that he walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He doesn't sit in the seat of the scoffer and stand in the place of the scorner. He loves the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night, and he's a blessed man. And all that he does, he prospers. He's a godly man. That description leads to a dialogue, though. So the first five verses kind of set it up. Now there's something going to happen. Now, now comes the action. Uh, now comes the drama. It's between, as you see there, the Lord, God himself, and Satan. God and Satan. This is a dialogue between the one who cannot lie, God. The one who cannot tell the truth, the devil. Again, there's another day, it tells us. And the sons of God, and I won't explain all this, but these are angels. It's a descriptive term for the angels. The sons of God presented themselves before the Lord. And note well who's with them. Note well. Satan. Uh, the Hebrew text actually says, the Satan. The Satan. Because it's speaking of a particular accuser, a particular adversary, which the scriptures describe for us all over the place as being the one that we call the devil. Uh, we call the prince of the power of the air. Uh, he's the accuser of the brethren. He's the dragon, the roaring lion who seeks those he, that he might devour. He's a liar. He's a murderer from the beginning, Jesus said. He presents himself before God. And when the Bible says the devil appears or Satan appears, we've got to stand up and take notice. He doesn't appear much, but when he does, it's important. We've got to pay attention to who he is and what he does to prepare ourselves how we are to respond to his temptations in our lives. And so these sons of God and the Satan or Satan present themselves. It's a way of describing a servant coming to a master. They present themselves to their maker, to their creator, the Lord, we're told. <clears throat> This, 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 this story in Job is so important as you see this dialogue beginning and the stage is being set, God and the devil, God and all these angels. It gives us a little, uh, a, a little window into heaven, into the spiritual realm. Uh, and we live in a world in which uh, so much uh, nihilistic philosophy says that there's nothing beyond this world. We're just atoms and molecules and matter and we, we are born and we die and there's nothing else. There's no soul. There's not even a conscience. There's certainly no life after death. We live in that kind of world, but we also live in a world where there are all kinds of hyper-spiritualistic forms of Christianity as well and other religions where behind every door and under every rock there's a demon or there's some kind of an evil force that's got to be cast out and we've got to be aware of them. Job helps us to calm down and just to realize that there is a spiritual realm but God's in control of it. Notice that. The sons of God, the Satan, they present themselves to the Lord. They're, they're servants. They have no more power than God allows them to have. Uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer, said that the devil is God's devil. The devil is God's devil. He only can do what God says he can do, and we see that here. Now note this in verse seven. Very interesting. Verse seven. It might not sound interesting, but it is. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord said to Satan, who initiates the dialogue? The sons of God? The Satan? Who initiates the dialogue here? They present themselves to God, but God speaks first. God initiates the dialogue. It's like we teach our children, we teach our grandkids uh, to respect those who are above them, their elders and those older than them by saying, you, you don't speak until you're speaking to first. It's a way of showing proper respect. And so the same thing here, they present themselves to God, but they are not al even allowed to come unless God allows them. They can't even say a word until God speaks. And so God speaks first. God initiates, from where have you come as if he doesn't know? Reminds us of what God says to Adam in the garden. Where are you? From where have you come? The devil says, Satan says, from going to and fro on the earth, walking up and down on it. Might sound to us like a nice leisurely stroll in the evening to get a little cool breeze in your hair after a long, hot day. It's not what it is at all. <laughs> I live on the ocean, and so this 
makes me think, oh, he's taking a nice stroll by, by the coast uh, in the evening when the, when the fog comes in and just a nice cool breeze. Not at all. These terms that are used here for walking back and forth, going up and down in the earth, uh, these are terms that are used in the Hebrew Bible to speak of the turbulence that an oar makes on the water. When you slap an oar on the water, it makes trouble. Uh, a swimmer who swims in the water, he's churning, he's splashing. Uh, it's used as a, for a whip that when it cracks, it cracks the sound of the air. The devil's not just going for a nice leisurely stroll. He's causing chaos. He wants to attack. He wants to do stuff. And when he walks around the world, he's going to tempt, to try, to lay snares, to set some bait out for the children of God, to capture, to grab their souls. That's what he's doing. He's the accuser. He's the devil. He's the liar. He's the murderer. He's up to no good. The Lord asked him, have you considered my servant Job? That there's none like him on, on all the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Now notice that the Lord is saying this, that he's glorifying himself really, isn't he? Have you considered my servant? Not just there's this guy Job, and I think he's really godly, look, look what he's doing. My servant. There's none like him on all the earth. God knows him. We sang that song, God knows Job. This is his servant, his beloved. Well, what can the Satan say? Because God has said, this is my servant, and he's a godly man, a righteous man. What can the devil do? He can't attack the life of Job because Job is a godly man again. But instead, he tries to attack the motives. He tries to attack the motives of Job. And this is so ludicrous. As if the Lord has no idea what's going on in Job's mind. Does Job fear God for no reason? That's the question. Does Job fear God for no reason? He's trying to say, inside, he's really a hypocrite. He only serves you, God, because of all the things that you're giving him. You've protected him with a hedge, it says. Uh, You've given him prosperity. You've blessed him. God knows his heart. God knows what's in his mind. And so the devil says, and the devil challenges God, stretch out your hands. Touch all that he has, and I guarantee it, he's going to curse you to your face. Since Job's a righteous man, Satan's only recourse is to try to get Job to do what God says he won't. God says he's a righteous man. He's He's a godly man. He fears the Lord. He's my servant. He tries to trick God. Again, it's just It's ridiculous. Stretch out your hand, he says to God, your hand. What does the book of James say about temptation? Do you remember what James chapter one says about temptation? When you and I are tempted, are we allowed to say, I'm being tempted by God? Can we say that? When you're being tempted, do not say, I'm being tempted by God. God cannot be tempted, nor does he himself tempt. The devil knows this. Of course, God knows that he's God. Notice the Lord, he says, all that he has is in your hand. He's in your hand. Against him, though, do not stretch out your hand. All the stuff, your your hand, not mine, yours. God gives permission to the devil to attack and to assault and to bring suffering into the life of Job. It might sound harsh to us, but just keep going, you'll see why. And so Satan reaches out in his insidious hand, and you see there uh, the, the four servants that the devil does not touch. He permits these four servants to stay alive so that they might be used to assault Job and to, to come against him, to test him. All of his animals are dead, the first servant says. Uh, some more animals are dead, the second servant says, and on and on and on. All of your kids, they're dead. There's nothing left. All that's left, we know, is Job, his wife, which we find that in a few verses, and these four servants. That's all that he has left. But Job doesn't do what God says, or what what the devil says Job would do. If you skip to chapter two, you see there the whole scene repeats itself. But then Job says something so astonishing. Here he has nothing, he's literally naked. All of his animals gone, all of his servants gone, his house is destroyed. 
He's got a wife now who's, cur- who's telling him to curse God and die. Four servants who bring no good news to him, but bad news. And there he is. And he says, naked I came out of my mom. Naked I'm going to go back to the grave. That's what the devil says, skin for skin. There's a, there's a Hebrew play on words here between what the devil says, uh, based on what Job said, skin for skin. All that a man has, he will give for his life. And so he's telling God, now just let me touch him. Just let me get my hands upon him. He doesn't do, though, what, God, what the devil said he would do. He doesn't do that. But he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes. Did you see what he told his wife also? It's an astonishing confession of faith, isn't it? His wife See, his wife, no doubt, is as grieving as Job. She must be feeling as depressed and despondent as Job. We know she must. She's a mom. Commentators look at the, 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 uh, Job's wife, and a lot of times they give her a hard time. They, they think that she's sort of the stern, mean wife that won't give Job a break. Her heart is crushed. She wants to die, too. There's nothing to live for, she feels like. But look what Job tells her. Should we receive just the good stuff that God gives to us, but not the bad stuff, the evil stuff? Everything comes to us by the powerful hand of God. In a mysterious way, everything comes to us in the providence of God, in the plan of God, the purpose of God. We can't explain it, but we know that it does. And Job gives us a little window into that world. Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die, his wife says, and we're probably with Job asking, why is this happening to me? Why would anything bad happen in my life? Why would God let this and fill in the blank happen to me? How could God do that? Why me? That's what we think. It's a natural question to ask. Those are natural questions to ask. If you read the Psalms, you'll see the very same thing. There's, there's a very deep spirituality in the Psalms of being able to complain, being able to ask God the why questions. God wants to hear us. Uh, the psalmist says he, t- he, he bottles up all of our tears. He wants us to cry. He wants us to ask why. He wants us to be angry, not uh, at everyone else and about myself, but he wants us to put our anger towards him in a holy way that he would redirect it to praise. All right, third point. How long has it been? I don't even know. <laughs> all all that. All that, this, this, uh, this description about Job, there's this dialogue about Job. And I don't like to say this is the good stuff, but this is the good stuff, the third point. <laughs> My wife teaches education. She always says, you've got to put all the good stuff at the beginning when they're all paying attention and then you sort of taper off as we're all sort of slumping down in our seats and then you kind of let them go easily. Uh, and I try to tell her, you know, teaching, education, it doesn't correlate one-to-one with preaching. So uh, there's got to be some surprise uh, in preaching. There's got to be some, some, some conclusion that, that brings it all together and lifts us up uh, to send us out in the power uh, of the Holy Spirit and, and the Word. So notice this. A, there's a declaration here about this man, a declaration uh, about him. And to go back to what I said at the beginning, Job is not in your Bible to give you and I the secret answer for why this suffering, why this temptation, why this trial, why this, uh, why this hardship happened to me or to someone else. It's not for that reason. It's in our Bibles again to show us that when we suffer, it's inside of Uh, The sovereign permission of God. Uh, Think of it like Jesus describes in John's Gospel, chapter 10. He he says that uh, in the Father's hand, he uses this this human illustration, in God the Father's hand are all of his children. And then he says, no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand, not even the devil. And then he says, no one can snatch them out of my hands. I and the Father are one. Job is in our Bible to tell us that when we suffer, it's all somehow in some way beyond our comprehension inside the hand of God. He's not let us fall out. He's not dumped us out, tipped us over. He hasn't let us fall through the cracks in his fingers. We're there. We're right there. 
And it's in our Bible for that and for us to be able to say, God, I trust you because of what you say about me. Job has no idea what the devil is saying, of course. This is all, uh, this is our privilege to know the story after the fact. Job is going through it. The devil's saying things about him. His wife is saying things. We'll see, you'll see later on that his friends are saying all kinds of things that he's sinned. He's got to curse God. If he doesn't, God's going to punish him. What has he done? Uh, find the secret hidden sin in his heart, in his life. That's why you're suffering. Everyone's saying stuff about Job, but what does God say about Job? Every one of us has friends and neighbors and family members, coworkers. They say a lot of stuff about us, don't they? We say a lot of things about each other, even as Christians. But what does God say about us? Well, Satan is telling God that Job serves God only because of what Job can get from God. And while his wife is saying, God is not even worthy of worship, curse him and die. God says something else. He's in total despair. There are times when you have been in total despair, no doubt. We have been depressed. We've been absolutely despondent, spiritually depressed, all the terms that we might use. We, we can feel what Job is feeling here. We've gone through something ourselves, but what does God say about us? God declares something about us, about Job, and we apply it to ourselves here. That sounds so good that it's got to be too good to be true. But it's not. It's not. That's, that's the great, that's, this is the gospel truth. What God says about us, it sounds ridiculous. It's foolishness to the world. But it's what God says, and it has to be true. Have you considered my servant Job? In other words, he's telling the devil, I have not forsaken you or forgotten you. In all of your sufferings that I have allowed, you are my servant. There is none on earth like him. In other words, God hasn't in your sufferings thrown you out like yesterday's garbage. You're a treasure to him. You're not trash to him. You're not a play toy for him. He treasures you. There's no one like this man on all the earth. God, notice, notice what God says about Job. He's blameless. Uh, the narrator says it in the first couple of verses, but then God repeats it. He's blameless. He's upright. He fears God. He turns away from evil. God says that about Job. And God says this about Job, even when Job is going to go on, if you read chapter three, to wish that he would just curl up in a corner in a ball and die. But God says, this is my servant, blameless, righteous, fears God, turns away from evil. He's, there's no one else like him. Job goes on to, to say out of one side of his mouth, I'm a sinner, and the other side, why me, I'm righteous. Yet God says, this is my servant, the one in whom I am well pleased. God says of Job then, when, when God is speaking here then, and when God is telling this to Job, he's also, we put ourselves in this situation, and when we are in suffering, it's not the why, but it's whose wisdom do I trust, and Job is telling us, trust God. God says of you and of me, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, that if we trust in his son, you are mine. You are forgiven. I've adopted you into my family. I've made you acceptable to me. My son has bled for you. The Holy Spirit has been given to you. You are justified, adopted. You're an heir of everything. You may not feel that. You may not see that. You may not think that, but you are. That's what the gospel is. It's such good news to us. Stupendous news, mind-blowing news to us. And so do you see what the Lord is trying to do to us or to say to us in this story today? Job 1, Job 2 is a window into heaven. It's a window into seeing how God sees us. That's why it's not about, you know, the big why question. No, it's about God. 
what does God see in you and me in our lowest lows, in our deepest depths? He allows lots of suffering to come into our lives. He permits suffering in the world. He allows this to come into our lives to justify his own declaration of you. To justify his own declaration to the devil and all the hordes of hell that this is my son, this is my daughter, I love him, I love her, he is mine, she is mine. And suffering comes to demonstrate that. To demonstrate that. When you suffer, God is holding you up to the world and the devil as a trophy of his own saving grace and his inscrutable wisdom. And this is why when we know what God knows and when we know what God says about us and when we embrace for ourselves what God says about us, we can say then in our suffering the Lord gave. The Lord's taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's when we know that God looks upon us in Christ as righteous, as loved, as acceptable, that we can say in the harshest times, shall I receive the good from God and not also the evil? And because what you know God thinks of you because of what you know, uh, because you know what God thinks of you, you can endure suffering. So when you suffer, when you see someone else suffer, and you come alongside them, put your arm around them, remember, what does God say about me? What does God say about his children in his word? This is my servant, righteous, upright, godly. This is my son. This is my daughter. Listen to me. Don't listen to yourself. Don't listen to all the self-help. Don't listen to the world, and don't listen to the devil. Listen to me. This is my servant, whom I love. Let's pray. Our wonderful and our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today, again, at the beginning of this week, this first day of the week, this Lord's Day, to dedicate ourselves to you in our singing and our praying our listening and our loving uh, each other because you've loved us so richly, so deeply, so greatly. Uh, We come uh, this morning before you and to give ourselves as living sacrifices because you've sacrificed your son for us, who himself, he was a true righteous man who suffered such unjust suffering, but yet endured it for our sake so that we might be found in him righteous. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we pray that you would help us as we are ourselves suffering to know what you think about us uh, and to embrace that for ourselves, make that our identity. But also, Lord, help us as we think about that for ourselves to, to be used by you. There are many people here and there are many people that we are gonna come into contact with this very week who are, who, are, who are hurting, who are broken, who are crying out for some help but may not even know knowing how to help us. Help us, Lord, to to bring to them the good news which heals souls, which restores lives. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.